<laughs> Dude, come on. The resurrection stories totally evolve over time. It's like a game of telephone, but with miracles. That's pretty sketchy. Hmm, what do you mean? Well, check it out. In Mark, there's zilch about Jesus appearing to his disciples after he rose from the dead. And Mark's supposed to be the OG gospel, right? Written 40 years after Jesus died. But then Matthew swoops in like 10, 15 years later, and suddenly Jesus is showing up a bit more, first to some women, then to his disciples in Galilee. And don't even get me started on Luke and John. They're practically packed with appearances. Hold up, you're missing a biggie. Oh yeah, what's that? Well, 1 Corinthians 15. I mean, it's got six separate sightings of the risen Jesus. Peter, the twelve, five hundred people at once, James, all the apostles, and even Paul got in on the action. Aren't scholars basically agree that's like our earliest source for the resurrection? Hmm, fair point. Luke shows Jesus appearing three times, four if you count the brief mention of him showing up to Peter. In John, he's got four appearances too. So the earliest account has Jesus popping up six times. Then there's supposedly a big fat zero in Mark, two in Matthew, and Luke and John are tied. That doesn't really seem like a solid argument, does it? But check this out. The stories get way more detailed as they go. Paul's not giving us much in Corinthians, just that Jesus appeared. Zilch when it comes to details. Mark's got angels chatting with women and some vague thing about Jesus appearing in Galilee, and scholars think that stuff after verse 8 was tacked on later. But again, zero physical details. Crickets. Then Luke's getting tactile. Jesus letting them touch him and chowing down on fish. And John, he's got Jesus strolling through walls, letting Thomas feel his wounds, having beachside barbecues. It's like they're jazzing it up to make it sound better. Hold on a sec, though. Paul's just dropping a quick reminder in Corinthians of an early Christian creed to clear up confusion. He's not penning a gospel. And about Mark, some big-shot scholars like Dr. Bruce Metzger reckon that we might have lost the actual real ending, Metzger, by the way, taught at Princeton. He's a total legend. He's questioning if Mark wanted to end with the women being scared stiff. Plus, any a Greek sentence with gar, like Mark does, is like finding a unicorn. So maybe there's more to Mark than we thought. And yeah, Jesus and Mark, definitely not some wispy Casper the Friendly Ghost. He's traipsing up to Galilee to see his disciples, leaving an empty tomb behind him. All right, but seriously, dude. You've got all these extra physical details in Luke and John that aren't in our earliest reports. It's like the gospel writers are trying too hard to make it all sound believable. Hold up, though. Matthew's no slouch in the physical details department. He's got earthquakes, women touching Jesus' feet, guards at the tomb, and even the chief priests trying to cover their tracks. So he's packing in the physical stuff, too, sounding just as apologetic as Luke and John. This is at best a tie. There's just no clear development pattern here, Flavius Brocephus. Okay, but seriously, look at all the deep theology John's throwing down. Thomas straight up poking Jesus' wounds and calling him, my Lord and my God. That's next level Christian theology that's not in the other gospels. Yeah, but let's think about Matthew for a second. He's the first gospel after Mark, and Jesus is dropping this bomb about baptizing folks in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That sounds pretty Trinitarian for his time, right? And what about Romans 10, 9 through 13? You've seen those verses everywhere on gospel tracks, right? Paul's laying it out. Confess Jesus, believe in his resurrection, and you're saved. And then he's quoting Joel about calling on the name of Yahweh for salvation, but he's equating it with Jesus. Paul's all over this saying his gospel lines up with what the big shots in Jerusalem are preaching. So there's just no real apparent evolution here. But Luke's got Jesus ascending into heaven. And John's talking about it too, plus all this business about Jesus breathing on them and them getting the Holy Spirit. The Gospels get progressively weirder in order to prove a point about Jesus. Right, and as you guys often like to point out, Matthew's throwing in some wild stuff too, like dead dudes rising and parading into Jerusalem, which nobody else seems to mention. Again, he's the second Gospel. There's some weirdness in all four Gospels. Look, man, you can't cherry pick like this. You can't just compare a couple of Gospels, sometimes throwing in Mark, and then hop between different categories of some supposed development whenever it suits your lame argument. It's like comparing apples with oranges. If you're going to argue against the resurrection, try a different angle. The development hypothesis just ain't it. But, but, but the Gospels are anonymous. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Contradictions. The census in Luke 
double donkey. My scholars, beep, boop, beep, boop, boop. 404. Argument not found.